education webinar series. Thank you all so much for joining us at 7 p.m. to 9 Eastern time for this amazing conversation about student perspectives on the future of inclusion and equity in K through 12 education. We brought you an absolutely outstanding lineup for this conversation and we could not be more grateful that you've decided to tune in and engage with us, all of you policymakers, administrators, nonprofit leaders, educators, parents, and families and students who tuned in for this conversation. Could not be more grateful to all of you and could not be more grateful to the amazing Hunt Institute team, Ramon, Julia, Allison, Jen, Abigail, Karen, uh, who have decided to volunteer your nighttime time to help this conversation be a success. Uh, and to make this conversation a success, we have Andrew Brennan, Education Fellow at National Geographic, Brianna Sia, Founder and CEO of Generation Vote, Ken Venliaco, Youth Advocate and Dean of Students at DC Public Schools, and Maya Logan, University Senate uh, Speaker Pro Tempore at the UNC Chapel Hill. I've been told I need to say the Chapel Hill. Uh, and to start off, um, we are going to have the Hunt Institute's fearless leader, our amazing Dr. Javed Siddiqui, give some opening remarks. So Javed, thank you so much for being here and please take it away. Thank you. No, thank you, Senegal. I appreciate you uh, creating this uh, platform for these young people. Uh, welcome to this week's episode of Race and Education uh, webinar series. As our country continues to provide daily reminders that highlight how far um, how far we have yet to go in our fight for racial justice and equality, we created this webinar series specifically to lift up important conversations centered around the interplay between race and education. Past conversations in this webinar series have focused on education policy, uh, topics like teacher recruitment, uh, pedagogy, and the effect of poverty on students of color. But when discussing the future of education in the United States, young people are often left out of critical decisions. However, we at the Hunt Institute, we believe that those most impacted by education policies should have a voice in shaping them. And given our commitment to student-centered approaches, our youth should always have a seat at the table. As such, it is an honor uh, to be able to host this conversation by including the voice of student leaders uh, and young people, uh, young people leading organizations, transforming policy and expanding uh, youth participation in politics and also certainly in education. So I want to uh, as, uh, echo Senegal's thanks and thank our panelists, uh, Maya, Brianna, and Kenvin for your leadership and inspiring other students to become leaders in their community and certainly make change in education policy. Also delighted uh, and excited to have Andrew, uh, who's an education fellow at the National Geographic, uh, serving as our moderator uh, for this uh, conversation this evening. Thank you, Andrew, for volunteering your time to lead this conversation and continue to be a champion for Youth Voice. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Andrew, to uh, offer some welcoming remarks and get our conversation going. Thank you very much and excited to be here. This is, I could not imagine a more important time to be discussing these issues, but also there's never not an important time to be talking about the role that young people uh, should be playing in our public schools. Um, my name is Andrew Brennan. I'm an education fellow for National Geographic. Uh, and as an education fellow and also an education advocate since high school, um, I've spent years reaching out uh, and having conversations with youth leaders from diverse regions, races, uh, and backgrounds. And uh, during these conversations, I'm often talking with students about uh, what is working and what is not working in their classrooms. Um, you'd be shocked by the number of students who have never been asked this simple question. Um, you know, we ask students to think critically about everything in school from math to science to history, but never actually about school itself. And when we do that, we miss out on a critical opportunity. Um, when I speak with students, I often begin with the question, what can you tell me about your schools that you think the adults in your school building don't know. On today's panel, you'll hear from students whose response to that question uh, doesn't necessarily end in simply identifying a problem, but each in their own way. Uh, Kenvin, Maya, and Brianna have identified issues in their communities uh, and have also taken action uh, to lead the search for solutions. Um, so while you listen to their stories tonight, I want you to consider uh, how and to what extent you are engaging students in your work to improve our public schools. Uh, has your engagement largely been surface level, having young people 
repeat talking points or serve in token positions on advisory committees uh, where they're expected to represent their entire age group? Um, or have you embraced what's possible and provided young people with meaningful seats at the table, uh, positioning them as full-blown partners in research, outreach, advocacy, and beyond? After all, to do so is to embrace the role that young people have played throughout history and throughout our country uh, in the fight for justice in our public schools. So uh, with that, I wanna introduce tonight's panel. I think you all are gonna love the work and the stories that they have uh, to bring to you tonight. And what I'm gonna do is I want each of you all to kind of introduce yourselves. And while you do, please answer the question, uh, and it's a simple one, why do policymakers, administrators, and educators need students to take a leadership role in transforming education policy and practice? And Maya, if it's okay, I'd love to start with you. Yes, thank you so much, Andrew. Just a fantastic introduction of yourself and of our objectives tonight. Um, I want to first off thank the Hunt Institute for having me. Um, and like um, Andrew has said, uh, my name is Maya Logan. I am a junior at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm currently studying quantitative biology and public policy with a minor in chemistry, and I'm on the pre-med track, so we are, we're almost at the finish line. <laughs> but to answer your question, and thank you so much for this question, um, you know, students are the main stakeholders at every front from elementary education to high school to college education. Students are the main stakeholders. And I, I, I like to say, um, I feel like some of our administrators and even educators fail to realize and recognize that, that students are the main stakeholders. And so rather than having students at the table, they tend to have the token positions, as you mentioned, and um, fail to realize um, at the end of the day, the outcome, the decision, um, whether, whether it's, you know, in the student's interest or not in the student interest, it will still impact the student regardless. So whether it is finances that it will be impacting or livelihood or even their mental health. And we can see that through university decisions during COVID-19. Um, specifically, you know, with my university, we started out, you know, mostly in person. Um, I took the, the responsibility to not return um, just because of my mental health and well-being I took that charge in my life but some students were not able to have the opportunity to have the decision to stay at home due to finances due to Wi-Fi connection other just just different other factors that um, factored into their decision however it is the role of the university of the school of administration to provide an equitable opportunity so that students can make these decisions whether they have the finances or not to be able to have a safe and healthy learning education and so with that being said I like to also state the importance of um, having student leadership not just from the top up but from the bottom up that's what we also fail to realize the importance of including the smaller voices and not just including them right we have to go beyond that um, because that's what I feel like we fail to um, do in universities and in high school middle school and elementary settings we always say you know oh we have the student perspective of, oh you know we have our student surveys so they can provide you know uh, responses and different things y'all I'm so tired of taking surveys I'm just I just put that out there <laughs> But I know it's a positive way to get feedback. However, a survey only goes so far, right? You have to be able to have their voice and have their voice not only just at the table, but implementing their ideas and implementing their conversations. And that's what I saw this summer um, sitting in on numerous meetings about the return and even now talking about spring semester. Um, just seeing that a lot of students' voices are, you know, kept quiet, although we're at the meetings. So. I would like to encourage any educator, administrator, or funding partners on the call today to go a step beyond, um, you know, just including the voices, implementing the ideas, having the follow-up conversations, either one-on-one or having group um, conversations to really, really get to the root of what the cause of an issue is and how the university, the school, or even um, a private sector um, school institution can be implemented. Um, to be helpful to implement decisions students make. Maya, I, I appreciate those comments so much. What I'm hearing is that, first of all, uh, it's not good enough to just have one student or uh, the most articulate student or the smartest student. Uh, it's about really trying to represent 
uh, the diverse perspectives that students have uh, and use that to inform uh, and form policy and would love to dig deeper into some of your experience both at UNC Chapel Hill and beyond uh, as we move through the evening. Um, but Kinvin would love to offer you the opportunity to answer the same question and also introduce yourself. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, thank you to the Hunt Institute uh, for having me. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kenvin Lacayo. I am the proud product of two Latino immigrant parents and the beautiful city of Washington, DC. I started working in education right out of high school. I was a leading man fellow with the Literacy Lab and I served uh, in AmeriCorps through the Literacy Lab. I've done work with the Obama Foundation and I am a proud uh, founding board member of the amazing organization, We Will All Rise. Uh, most recently, uh, and, and don't quote me on this, but I like to say uh, that I am the youngest Dean of Students uh, in DCPS history. Uh, and to answer your questions, uh, I believe that policymakers uh, and all other people working with and around uh, young people need students to take a leadership role because um, policymakers are public servants first and foremost. Um, I like to say that if restaurants uh, operated the way that many of our elected officials and public leaders do, then we could probably permanently erase dining expenses out of our budgets uh, because they would be closed. Uh, waiters and chefs don't bring you out whatever they think you should eat. There's a conversation and there's a menu. Uh, many, many policymakers are not having a conversation. And uh, quite frankly, this country's uh, menu uh, solutions uh, isn't great. Uh, so their, their job is not to provide uh, whatever solution they see fit, but to listen to the students they serve and work together uh, with them and their community uh, to solve those issues. Students know the problems because they face them every single day and, and they know their communities, their peers and the shared values and perspective. Uh, young people uh, when empowered have shown time and time again in history uh, and in recent memory that they will get the job done. There's no secret agenda. Uh, and are only looking to bring change because they care and because they face these issues uh, daily. Um, policy is, uh, makers and others are pulling together solutions without inviting who they serve and even uh, ignoring them and, and ignoring their responsibilities um, as pub public servants as a result. Uh, with the response to COVID-19, uh, you've seen so much of that locally and uh, nationally uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, having uh, teachers take surveys and then completely ignoring the responses from the teachers, having the Washington Teacher Union have to step up and, and try to advocate for the teachers and, and still um, the, the DCPS not, not adhering to what uh, teachers are saying, to what families are saying, to what students are saying. Uh, and as of, as of, as of late, uh, announcing plans that do not uh, ha have our students uh, in, 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 in the front, forefront of their decisions. Uh, students should be first in line uh, for these conversations and should be spearheading uh, the solutions because they are first in line when it comes to dealing and experiencing with the outcome of whatever decision whoever makes. Uh, so that's why we need students leading the transformation of education. I don't think I could have said it better myself. I especially appreciate your call out that we need to not be working or doing things to students doing things for students, but instead honoring the agency that we know young people possess in working with them to solve some of these problems. And then also I think the point that you made toward the end is especially important for uh, those who are doing education advocacy. Young people don't represent a political, they're not part of a special interest, they're breakthrough advocates in public education because they are fundamentally self-interested. They are the ones who need this education uh, in order to do things like uh, end cycles of generational poverty. And so uh, they're very effective advocates and we should be welcoming into them and to our coalitions. Um, Brianna, I did want to go to you next and give you the opportunity to answer the same question and also introduce yourself uh, uh, tonight. Yeah, damn. I mean, one one thing that I miss about doing these events in person is like, I can just clap and snap because I'm fired up after those intros and we didn't even get started, y'all. <laughs> like, wow. Um, so just wanted to say that I'm feeling I'm feeling super motivated and inspired by both of uh, Maya and Kenvin. Your remarks are amazing. And um, yeah, I wanted to also thank my fellow Bearcat uh, Senegal for inviting me to this. 
and, and to the Hunt Institute and to Andrew for facilitating this discussion um, in, in the, and talking about the role that educational policy has in combating systemic racism in the education system and more broadly, I think our democracy, right? So again, my name is Brianna Sia. I am the CEO and founder of GenVote, a youth-led organization that is dedicated to advancing youth voting rights in New York and beyond and transforming the way young people engage in local politics. So I work with students all day, every day. Um, and in my day job, I also work at the Brennan Center as a senior researcher there. So to answer your question about how young people can take a leadership role in transforming educational policy and practice, I want to bring into this conversation and talk throughout the night about how young people can work with educators to transform civic education in our schools and reimagine how young people come to age in our democracy, right? You know, for the past few years, for decades, quite frankly, governments across the country have dismantled civic education programs in our middle and high schools. So it should be no surprise when young people in many communities particularly in, in communities of color, when they say that political participation is not established as an expectation for young people, right? Or when I talk to my GenVote students, they share that the different ways or different avenues of civic engagement are unclear to them once they reach college, right? But too often we hear this narrative that young people are apathetic. They don't care. They're not taking the time to know, right? But it's much deeper than that. And I challenge all of the educators here, the policymakers here to think about how we can challenge that narrative and really look at the root issues as to why youth voter participation in the United States is so much lower than our peer countries, right? So I encourage all of you tonight to view civic education in particular as a crucial piece in the fight for our generation's right to vote because I think no young person, no student should be left out of the political process just because of their zip code or just because of the school that they're zoned in, All right? So we, we wanna think of ways that students and educators can take a leading role in transforming educational policy and, and how we can invest in policies that strengthen civic education because an investment in the ballot box is also an investment in my future, in our generation's future. So I just want to end my, my remarks with just asking you all to imagine the following. Just imagine how different our future would be if every single high school had the resources to teach one year of civics, had the resources to pre-register all 15 and 16 year olds to vote. Heck, imagine if 16 year olds could vote, right? We won't go there tonight. Um, and also provide students the opportunities to serve in local governments or other service opportunities and work in our local communities on the county level, state level, right? And imagine if we work in colleges, imagine if every single college in the United States had election day off. So faculty and students can work as poll workers, both during national pandemic and not, um, and, and also get out the vote. So I just want to leave you all with, with just as we talk tonight, imagine, right? Because we need to start asking these bigger questions. And these questions need to come not just from students, but also from the educators and the folks who are writing the rules. Uh, yeah, Brianna, thank you so much. And for putting the importance of this discussion in the context of its effect on our democracy. And I think your point is well taken. It is clear that the cumulative effect of the institutions our black and brown students encounter from kindergarten on is to insist that their voices and their bodies don't matter. So why should we be surprised when um, their political participation reflects that our collective effort is to break down those beliefs? Um, and yes, I just want to underscore we should lower the voting age, not only for all elections, but especially for school board elections uh, to 16. Um, Kinvin, I would love to start the conversation out with you, in part because well, I mean, there's a piece of context I want to set. 80% of the teachers in this country um, are white, and we know that uh, they harbor or tend to harbor similar levels of anti-Black, pro-white bias as the broader uh, public. And so my question to you, uh, both as a former student of color, now as an educator of color, what do you think is the importance of having educators that look like you in school? And how do you think about your role as a student of color instructing students. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, 
I think that the role that educators of colors play is absolutely paramount to the success of students of color. Um, and I've seen that both in my experience as a uh, student and in my experience as an educator. Uh, when I was um, a leading man fellow straight out of high school, uh, I remember having students who uh, initially uh, were saying that they were going to shoot me and kill me. And these are three-year-olds. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and throughout the year, um, I made sure to love them and I made sure to uh, never leave their side. And, you know, and, and by the end of the year, my three and four year olds were calling each other kings and queens and, and, and even arguing, you know, there were three. So arguing sometimes about who was a king and who wasn't a king. Um, but I think that the, the, the importance is uh, not only the fact that you see somebody who looks like you in a role that isn't traditionally presented to you. Uh, and, and of course, that's extremely paramount because, you know, familiarity breeds likeness and, and our students need to be able to see um, in order for them to be. Um, but also because um, as educators of colors, uh, as, as educators of color, you have uh, experiences um, that can care that that you can relate to with your students. Um, and so it's not a um, it's not just a comfortability comfortability of like speaking about, um, you know, race and these issues and all these other things, but it's a leaning into it uh, because it is your experience. It is um, the experience of your family members, of your friends. Uh, it, it is the, the communities that you grew up in uh, have experienced the same thing that uh, your students have faced. Um, I, I, the elementary school that I worked at uh, was a block away from my grandmother's house and the middle school that I work at now was, is right behind my high school. Uh, and so my students uh, feel almost more like you know, like family, like family. And, and so uh, that leads to, to, to having conversations that, um, again, this, it, that leads to conversations that is not, are not happening just because I'm comfortable with those topics, but because I need to have those conversations because they matter to me so much. And, and I know that they matter to my students because just uh, three weeks ago, I had a, an hour and 15 minute long conversation about race with my middle schoolers who are 11. And um, it was obvious to me that they were uh, in such dire need of these conversations. And it obviously wasn't because they couldn't have them. It was because nobody was asking them. And it was because nobody was bringing that up to them. And, and so, um, you know, just being intentional about those things, because they matter so much to you as an educator of color. Um, and as, you're, as a person of color. Absolutely, and I, and I do just wanna underscore that the burden of educating um, our students about the history and the legacy and the reality, the current reality of race in America does not just fall to educators of color, um, but is the responsibility especially of, of white educators. Maya, I would love if you could pick up uh, where Kinvin left off, uh, reflecting on your own experience um, as a woman of color growing up in South Carolina uh, public schools, um, the role that educators of color or the lack thereof um, played in your understanding of, of, of public education and of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kenvin uh, touched on a very important point that I'd like to just reiterate. You said familiarity breeds likeness. That is so key. And um, as you said, I am the proud product of the great state of South Carolina <laughs> and the public school system from K through 12 and college. Now I attended all public schools all my life. Um, that said, um, I was the only black girl to graduate from my STEM cohort in high school and continuing my STEM degree in college, I am still seeing the same exasperated issues of racial inequity, racial bias, systemic issues with the girls of color, especially black girls in STEM. And that's where I stand in the gap of. Um, as a first semester uh, student at UNC, I founded a STEM initiative to increase the amount of girls that we have in STEM, um, especially our black girls in South Carolina. And one thing that I, I saw with leading a group of girls and hearing their experience, not only did I resonate with all of them because I, I too am in that space, um, I saw where women and black individuals do not become scientists and engineers at the same rates that people think and might expect. Um, talking with, um, you know, 
industry leaders, um, industry professionals in the science and engineering space, oftentimes they're isolated because they don't have that familiarity space or they don't have that colleague or supervisor uh, to be able to relate with. And that stems back down to who we have as educators in our public school systems. So um, with that being said, uh, you, you um, shared something on Facebook um, that I also like to bring uh, Andrew to the conversation of having how many uh, black teachers have you had in your life? And that was a great question. Uh, for me, I had none, right? I had none. I did not have my first black educator until my sophomore year of college. Y'all, that was just last year. Um, he was an awesome uh, professor. He actually taught um, at UNC. Uh, he's a rap lab professor, awesome. Um, but he taught me the importance of, you know, having a person of color leading in the forefront. I felt comfortable expressing my viewpoints and ideologies with him. Even if we didn't align on certain things, I felt comfortable. And that's the key thing in education. Are you offering a space where students are comfortable? And in high school and in elementary and middle, I, I didn't feel comfortable having these tough conversations with my teachers. You know, I didn't feel comfortable saying, hey, I really feel isolated because no one in my class looks like me or I don't understand the subject matter when all of my friends are parents are doctors and lawyers and, you know, holding high positions. That wasn't my case. Um, I'm a first generation college student and in high school, I was just trying to navigate it all. So um, with that being said, your question of, you know, the importance of it, it is, it's very important. And what, I, what I've seen and the questions that I encourage all leaders and educators to ask is what accounts for the observed underrepresentation in your school system or in your sector that you're working for? Are you not, you know, offering that? Are you not offering the space for people to openly express who they are and whom they are? Um, so those are just questions I would like to bring in this space because those are questions I don't feel that are being asked daily. And that's very important to account for as, you know, students of color are, you know, in every space. So we have to be making sure that we have to include leaders that look like students of color as well. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you uh, bringing up um, the number of, of black teachers that you've had. Um, Maya, I, I've had one uh, black teacher during my 13 years of grade school. And I mean, it, it does matter. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I, I, I really just can't express that enough. But um, Brianna, I, I wanted to turn uh, to you for a second. And, you know, we really, we referenced this earlier, but this idea that um, our schools are really meant to be incubators uh, for our democracy and the notion that, um, you know, right now, rather than cultivating citizens that question authority, uh, that embrace their agency, uh, too often our schools are cultivating uh, compliance. Um, and so I would love if you could speak to a little bit, um, thinking both in the context of education, but also our broader civic system, uh, if you could just speak to some of the barriers that are preventing students of color from participating um, in the policy process more robustly, uh, both within schools and not, and also uh, some of the things that you've seen um, that have helped uh, to uh, increase or encourage uh, that participation among students of color. Awesome. That's an, that's an amazing question, Andrew. I'm going to try to answer it briefly. I can go on forever about this. So uh, in terms of the barriers, right? So. At Genvo, what we focus on is that very first step that prevents young people from, especially students of color, from participating in the political process, and that is having access to the ballot box, right? So having access to civic education is a part of this, right? And it fuels um, the, the challenges and the barriers that prevent young people from actively being able to vote, um, but also educating educators about this crisis that I feel like no one's talking about until recently which is what we call the youth voter suppression crisis, right? So to provide some context for folks that uh, may not be aware of this issue, in 2018, as some of you may know, young people really rocked the vote, right? So young folks turned out in record numbers. I think there was like over 31% of young people showed up to the polls. Um, and after the record-breaking youth turnout of like, you know, folks age of 18 and over, uh, local governments across the country move to specifically suppress the youth vote. Um, and this also brought to light a broader movement to silence the voices of young people, even before the 2018 midterms, right? 
So what we've seen across the country from New Hampshire to Texas to Wisconsin, we've seen young people be forced to jump over hurdles to exercise this right to vote and to participate in the political process. So what does this look like, right? This looks like not being able to find poll sites close to campus. In states like North Carolina, I can go off about North Carolina, uh, there were efforts to eliminate pre-registration programs, specifically because they were registering younger people to vote. And, and even worse, in, in communities across the country, in the North and the South, we've seen students show up in communities uh, and, and, and they show up to these poll sites where there's like, not, like no other young people, no other POC people working as poll workers, and they're harassed and told, go back to your home state. You're not from here. That one, one instance of that happened in Connecticut, right? So, you know, this, and these issues disproportionately affect young voters of color, since many of the voter suppression tactics used against young voters are the very same tactics used to suppress the vote in black and brown communities specifically. So tactics like restrictive voter ID laws that make it impossible for low income voters and young people, you know, students, for example, to obtain the proper voter ID. And we're seeing that play out in the federal courts um, over the recent attempts of the voter ID law in North Carolina, right? And there's litigation in Wisconsin. Or efforts to cut early voting sites that serve students on college campuses and also benefit the, you know, POC voters in that community. We saw that happen in Florida. Um, and so, you know, in some states, they've even gone so far to target young black and brown voters, such as gerrymandering, HBCUs like Prairie View a and and North Carolina a and University. So I share these examples because what I think is really evil and insidious about some of these efforts, or all these efforts, is that folks in power know what they're doing. And they, and they know that because our generation is the most diverse block of voters that this country has ever seen. And it will be confirmed after this 2020 census, right, which I hope you all filled out. So by targeting the youth vote, people are in power are either intentionally or maybe not intentionally, not realizing it, upholding institutions that perpetuate systemic racism for our generation. And, you know, this youth voter suppression crisis is real, and I think we're going to see more of it um, in the lead up to November 3rd, but also after 2020. And at Jam Book, what we're doing about it is that we believe that we need to, to have a grassroots movement that's led by young people in every state to advance a new vision for the future of our democracy in our schools, on our campuses, in our communities. And, and what does that mean to engage in the political process? And, and we're starting um, this and to lay the groundwork for this in our own home state of New York. That's where I'm from. Um, and we're hoping that the blueprint that we're building in New York can spread to states across the country because we believe states are the laboratories for democracy, right? If we can make things happen in, in New York, Texas, California, right? Uh, why not Congress? So just to share a little bit about what we're doing in New York for folks in the call that uh, are either from New York or might may want to use some of the tactics that we're doing here. You know, our home state, folks may not know this, but New York actually has a second to lowest youth voter turnout in the country. I think Arkansas was last place. Um, and up until 2019, we had one of the worst electoral systems as well. I believe in the North Carolina litigation, they pointed to New York and said, New York doesn't have early voting, so why are you coming after us? <laughs> And so that is why Generation Vote, in partnership with the Let New York Vote Coalition, launched a youth-focused, a Let New York Vote youth working group in 2019. And this basically uh, culminated in the first statewide summit centered specifically on expanding youth voting rights and civic engagement in our schools. So we brought together over 70 voting rights activists, high school students, college students, to deliberate on the challenges that they've had in the political process and to think about what would a new youth voting rights agenda look like in New York. And at the end of this summit, the participants then voted on what we now call the first New York Youth Voting Rights and Civic Engagement Platform. And this platform has laid the groundwork for our statewide campaign that's been quite successful so far and includes policies such as automatic vote registration, mandating on-campus poll sites on college campuses, both private and public, uh, for both early voting and general elections, lowering the voting age to 16, extending time off to vote to schools, and uh, creating a new Student Voter Empowerment Act 
for all the public universities in New York modeled after what they did in California just a year or two ago. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about, the, about what we've done so far, but I think this, this, this can lay the groundwork again for a, a new agenda to, to overcome these barriers for, for young people. And, and toward the beginning of your remarks, uh, Brianna, you pointed out how diverse our generation is, and it's such an important reminder, um, both in society broadly and in our school system specifically, the people in power are largely white, but the young people are largely not. Um, and so when we talk about increasing student agency, student power, youth power and society in our schools, we are talking about a transfer of power uh, from white people to non white people. And so uh, when that happens, that can be uncomfortable, there can be pushback, but also uh, I think the sharing of that power can be such a beautiful uh, thing when it comes to progress in our education system. Uh, Brianna, I would, would love to stick with you for just one more second to talk a little bit more about civic education, uh, something that you mentioned at the beginning of uh, the discussion. We know that civic education traditionally has looked like learning about government in a textbook or through simulated classroom experiences. What does civic education look like in the 21st century uh, in a world where we know that young people are on the leading edge of some of the fights for uh, justice and civic society? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think some of us may have taken civic courses in high school. And for me, it was like one term maybe of like opening my textbook and, and saying, okay, this is what Congress does and this is my representative. And it was so boring. <laughs> and I was never pushed as a young person to think about how that that representative on that piece of paper had power over things that I cared about. So I think as we think through and challenge ourselves to build interactive and inclusive civic education curriculum, it has to include uh, processes that, that help students understand why the issues that they care about in the local communities matter in the political process, right? So too often, again, those questions are left out. The idea of building civic plans and those questions and deliberations don't happen in, in many civic courses at the moment. And there are so many ways you can do that, right? Whether it be through giving educators the tools to have these deliberations, to have these discussions with their students, to also um, give educators the freedom to potentially bring the students outside of the classroom, to go visit right? Go visit your local government, right? And, and if you don't have uh, a, a, any sort of channels or avenues for young people to, to directly work with your local legislators, create them and implement them into your civic curriculum. So I think it has to be interactive. It has to be interesting. And finally, again, like I said, it has to be inclusive. And we have to make sure that any sort of civic education curriculum we have also is reflective of our history and is and, in a real and authentic way. And, and deals with the systemic racism that many of these institutions have perpetuated and their roots, right? Um, understanding that a lot of these voter suppression laws have their roots in the Jim Crow era, right? Most people don't know that. And so we need to be, real, again, so that those are the three tenets I would recommend for building out the civic education. There's a hundred other ways you can do it. Um, and there are amazing groups like Generation Citizen and others that are working um, actively in schools now to kind of build the curriculum for folks. Maya, I see that you want to jump in there, and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it right to you. I promise, right now. But I just also want to add another element that I hope you can respond to as you do. Um, you know, you are the speaker pro tem of the Student Congress at UNC Chapel Hill, a school that is known for its long history of student self governance, the role of student led protests, uh, both in the civil rights movements and in the anti war movements, also the site of an ongoing lawsuit trying to dismantle affirmative action in this country. Uh, and so I just I want you to both, uh, you know, I would love to hear what you have to say about the civic education and, and the context of that, but also just as you are embracing this role um, th that you have, would love any reflections that you have uh, from that as well. Of course. What I was just going to say is, first off, Brianna, I wish you could, wish, I wish you could have been my teacher. <laughs> You just did that so perfectly in high school and in middle school. You know, I was involved with civic engagement and civic education, but that did not start from, you know, school. It started from my passion within. But if I would have had a teacher like you, I would have been more interested in social studies and history because those were the classes I was like, not for me. <laughs> 
but uh, I really love your, your tenets and ideas. And uh, to touch on what Andrew has um, asked is that UNC is a community that fosters a voice for students. It fosters a voice for students, but the, my point of the role that I serve in is going further than the fostering part, because that's what it has done and led a legacy of, is fostering the voices. But including and implementing, as I touched on in the beginning, has been lacking. And that's what we've seen over this course of this year um, in planning. And right now, currently, we're planning our reopening phases. It is really putting pressure going further than just including the voices and really saying that, do you see what happened when you did not include student voices at the beginning of the school year? Now it's time to go a step forward to include student voices, implement their ideas, and have conversations, right? And um, what I what I saw, and you know, the surveys that we have, you know, received and collected data on, um, is that students of color, students of low income background, students who are like me, out of state they are footing the bill, right? And that is not only on UNC's campus, but campuses around the world. I was talking with a friend who goes to South Carolina College and how their COVID-19 response has been horrendous. And that's uh, the case on some in most college campuses in this US. So um, with that being said, one inch, what, what things that I have done to implement change on my campus, alongside my colleagues and working with um, our speaker of the Senate, and um, also I serve as the co-chair of a newly found commission this summer on campus equality and student equity. We've released, um, you know, different tactics to help students. So at the beginning, we started with raising money and creating a, a mutual fund, mutual aid fund, to be able to support students who had to leave campus, um, you know, immediately without having the income or the support from the school, we were the ones that stood in the gap. And then from there, we advocated for a pause in the semester at the beginning because it was so much going on. We're all battling a pandemic. And it's not just the pandemic we're battling. We're battling seeing these issues up front. And that's one thing I've been talking with um, people who are not of color, because that's one thing we have to do as people of color. You know, we have to take in our ideas. But we also, I'm interested at least in knowing what is the white perspective? What is the, what is the white perspective? Um, and so one thing that I have seen is the white perspective sometimes do not know what's going on in the black perspective or in the Hispanic perspective or Asian perspective, right? But it's not our job to, you know, insinuate those conversations. These are conversations we should be having mutually, right? So we decided to do a pause in the semester to benefit all students, but we also saw where students who are not of color were also, you know, suffering in spaces um, and students of color who were not only suffering, but having to foot the bill of not having the income to successfully complete college. So we advocated for this pause. And then from there, we advocated for a pass-fail option, uh, which was passed, and we are able to pass, pass fail some of our courses um, if you know need be. Um, and with that being said, you know, just really seeing that these changes that we advocated for are off the backs of students, right? So that just goes back to the legacy and the fulfillment of students and the, the trajectory student leadership has in getting things done and implementing ideas and most importantly, pushing back against administration. I feel like students now, Gen Z, my gen, we take we take a no problem in pushing back, whether it's on social media, in person, over Zoom. That's one thing I have seen. We can get we can get rowdy on Zoom. So, uh, <laughs> um, but I would say that is needed, right? It's not to the time to be complacent. Uh, we've been complacent for a long time, and going back to Jim Crow, um, black folk, we've been complacent. And um, with that being said, it's no longer time to be complacent. It's time to really put the pressure on the people who do have the power. And that transition of power is what I'm seeking to do at UNC uh, to show that Black voices, Black faces, Black bodies mean more than just the statistic and just getting the scholarships in and getting the numbers right. We are people that walk on this campus that built this campus. And we are the ones that are trying to advocate for all students as well. So I hope that answers your question I can go off um, <laughs> I can go off more but I will limit my uh, remarks <laughs> I could let you just uh, speak for the rest of the panel I think it would be fine but 
but I do, I mean, I, I want to underscore, I mean, you're basically saying, and this is a quote from a student activist uh, from New York that I know, but that student voice is great, uh, but what's even better is adult action. Uh, and that's really what youth advocates are looking for when we are pushing for justice. Um, and I just, I just also wanted to react to your comment about the surveys, because like I also have been in that situation so many times where I'm filling out endless surveys. What adult policymakers and decision makers though need to keep in mind is that there's a lot of power in who is asking the questions when it comes to surveys. So don't just involve students in your surveys, involve them in the design of those surveys and in the questions that you ask. I think you'll find your results to be much more um, meaningful. Um, there's a presidential debate tonight, everyone. Uh, <laughs> and as we know, um, our students are going to be watching how our political leaders comport themselves and what they are saying about people that look like them. And so, Kinvin, I, I'd love to just throw it to you for a second. Um, as you think about how you're going to interact with your students tomorrow, um, having come to school, having watched this presidential debate, um, what are you going to want them to know? What are you going to say to them? Um, and do you have any advice uh, for other educators that might be watching who are preparing for those same conversations? Um, what are they going to say to their students? That is a great question. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the first thing uh, that I would like to say is that like, um, for a lot of these uh, bigger issues, um, I try to lean on my mentors and, and people that um, I have around me uh, who have endless years of, of ex experience uh, in the education field. Uh, and so I would urge other educators to do the same thing, uh, to find people who they trust uh, and people who uh, they can lean on in order to uh, try to find answers to these uh, sort of important and broader questions. Uh, but in terms of how I'm going to speak to my students about the uh, about the debate, um, I think that the 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 most important thing is sort of giving them the space to be candid and be real about their feelings and their own uh, perception of what happened. Um, I think that uh, you know, and it goes right along with uh, everything that we're talking about. Um, we often uh, I say we as an, as an adults um, often sort of push our own values and our own perspectives onto our students uh, and, and sort of start these conversations, uh, but then sort of take the lead on them when uh, the students are the ones who should be uh, leading the conversation. And so I think that the, the, the most important part uh, for me and for any other educator would be to give them uh, the space to speak about it and to make sure that you're uh, listening to them and that you're putting them on the forefront of the conversations because uh, like it's been mentioned so many times student voice is great uh, but you have to be listening uh, and so we can't continue to uh, ask our students what they think what they want to do what they saw how they feel about it uh, and then just leave it at that uh, and and so I guess responding also uh, is absolutely important uh, and, and not just tomorrow, not just Friday, uh, but the weeks ahead. Um, there's a lot going on uh, and my students have, you know, talked about so much, so have talked to me so much about uh, COVID, the pandemic, quarantine, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests and all these things. And, and so uh, continuing to check in on them, continuing to give them those spaces, continuing to make sure that they're okay because uh, us as adults are struggling to be okay uh, and so our students who are under 18 years old uh, have to have those spaces to be okay because they're strong they're resilient but they don't they shouldn't have to be all the time i appreciate that um kenvin and and, and, it, and i know that it is i mean it has been tough for a lot of young people we know even uh from last year that we started uh, to run for president that uh, students of color were experiencing increased levels of, of bullying and harassment uh, in the classroom. And so these things do trickle down uh, and it's important to talk about them and not just uh, kind of brush them under the rug. Um, so there's a question in the chat that I think it's a perfect one to end on um, that I would love to offer to each of you. Uh, it's from Renee Elridge. I, I hope I'm saying her name correctly, but she's, she says, uh, as a white parent and school board member serving in a district that is 80% Latino, 
uh, what would you advise I do to help build a bridge between the school board and Latino parents and students? And I think that really the question can be expanded to include uh, Black families and other communities of color. And so, um, Brianna, I'd love uh, to start with you if, if, if that's okay. Uh, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here with this one, uh, but would love if you have any advice, um, you know, particularly for you know, school board members, elected officials uh, who are seeking to build a bridge with young people in their community. Yeah, that's, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and thank you, Renee, for asking this question. And also, Andrew touched upon an important fact that many young people don't realize school board members are, are elected, right? In many communities, if not all. Um, and so to answer this question of what would, what, what should you do to build a bridge between the elected officials, right? The elected school board members and your students of color more broadly. Um, I think there's so many different ways, but that we can build that bridge. We wanna make sure that we are intentional about it, right? So many, I think earlier in the, in the conversation, we talked about um, committees that are created that, uh, end up tokenizing uh, the POC parents or the student that steps up. Um, so I would say that first off, um, if there are, even just evaluating what are the structures in place that your school board has to help parents, especially, you know, it's the Latino parents you mentioned, but also just more broadly, other folks of color, what avenues and what structures does your school board have to make them feel comfortable to attend these meetings and to also raise their concerns, right? Um, look at how is your public comment period structured, right? And there are all different ways and practices that promote deliberative uh, and democratic discussions. And so, you know, really have that internal discussion with your school board members about, you know, how do we structure our meetings? How do we invite people into these spaces? What does the room literally look like when they enter, like when people enter the room? You know, being intentional about the design, I think is super important because it's one thing to just invite people for public comment or to just to create the committee. But being intentional again and doing your research to see what has worked to create and foster cultures of trust and, and, and engagement uh, amongst uh, primarily white, you know, school board communities and also um, the, 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 the PRC folks that, that are within those districts. So that's my one recommendation and probably the one I would start with there. Um, and then if those institutions and those structures don't exist, thinking about ways that you can, that you can create them. Um, and then I think the final thing I would, I would say here is li listening to your young people, right? And the young people, um, they, they may or may not be having these conversations with their parents. So making sure that you are also building ways to not only listen to the parents, but also to the, to the students themselves. Um, and folks mentioned earlier, like surveys are one thing, but actually working with young people to design the type of forums, whether it be in person or online surveys, to facilitate those questions is another thing, right? So I would say listen directly to the student, think about how you're engaging their, their, their feedback and, their, and, and listening to their stories, and also being intentional about how you're designing your spaces and your, and your, and your meetings. Awesome, Maya, same question to you. Um, what, how can um, our elected officials, our decision makers, our white leaders help to build a bridge? Yeah, so I will speak from the student perspective. Um, you have to meet people where you have to meet people where they are, right? So you can't set up an environment where only white individuals can attend. So meeting people where they are means that you know hosting or having town hall events or a public comment period around the time where parents can actually attend, working families can attend. So that means maybe having um, your meeting later in the day, having a virtual setting for both. Um, your public comment and different things like that, um, have exploring those options. So I would say meet people where they are, um, having affordable options for them to attend. You know, maybe you can be able to offer an Uber Lyft service for parents that are interested. Um, take, because I, I know school boards receive some some form of funding. So using those um, those tactics to encourage the families to attend, that's one thing that I saw in my um, in my community is that 
originally, I didn't even know what a school board was. I didn't know the functionings of a school board. But now as a college student and realizing the importance of a school board and seeing right now in South Carolina, we have a stiff, stiff, stiff race um, in Columbia going on with school board. So um, just seeing how impactful the leaders that you elect um, in your school board and how it changes the dynamic of leadership in the school of period. So um, I would say, one, meet people where they are, and two, ask the in intentional questions of what has failed in the past, right? So I, I really strongly believe in acknowledging your failures. And so if you can acknowledge, you know, some things that might have not worked in the past and how you can improve upon those. And just going back to um, performative leadership, not having performative leadership. And what that means is, you know, electing people of color, having them so serve as a token, you know, just going down the same pipeline of tokenism. Really meet, meeting people where they are, asking those intention, intentional questions, seeing where you have failed in the past, and most importantly, encouraging the room to be involved in these decision makings, right? And so encouraging more people of color to be in the public comment period, whether it is offering services that they can be able to attend, changing your schedule so that more parents of color can attend, because typically that is a, a main in, inhibitant for uh, people of color, work their work schedule. You know, we have to meet people where they are and, um, you know, just working with families and seeing what the students are really needing in your district or in your community. And Kenvin, can you close us out? I think they got it. Uh, no, <laughs> um, I love everything that Maya and Brianna said. Um, I think that all of those things would lead to changing perspective. And I think that perspective is so important for everybody involved. Um, I think that the perspective of uh, a lot of people who are elected, a lot of people who are running about the communities, uh, you know, Latino communities, black communities and, and young people uh, needs to be changed in order for them to understand that they actually do need to do everything that Maya outlined uh, in order to support them. And then once they do those things, uh, then the perspective of those communities will change in their in their favor uh, because a lot of those uh, a lot of la la the Latino community the black community a lot of them and young people a lot of them just feel like it isn't for them and it's a perspective that has uh, has hurt them and it's it's a perspective that has mostly been um, in, that's mostly been set up by the people who have been in power um, and so I think that changing those perspectives uh, for elected officials and uh, for the communities is, is is super important. And I think that, like Maya said, meeting people where they're at, uh, give, give students, give young people, give Latino communities, minority communities of all kinds, exactly what they need uh, and when they need it, if, if you ever wanna hear their vote. Um, I, I think that, uh, I feel like Brianna's gonna know, but uh, Greg Abbott in Texas, uh, you know, and, and everything he's doing over there is absolutely ridiculous. And the fact that there's 10 uh, states in this country that don't have online registration for voters uh, and, and with a generation who is so, you know, in tuned with technology, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. And, and I think that those are the things that, that you need to do in order to, to bridge that gap. Actually, can I just jump in? I'm oh, sorry, Andrew. One thing I want to do is just want to throw out there too that we didn't talk about recruit young people to run for school board. And I'll just leave it with that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, honestly, my answer to the question is basically you should ask yourself three questions. One, is there a student on your school board? Two, do they have the same vote that you do? And three, can students vote for your seat on the school board? Uh, and I think those are the three questions that are going to lead to more power and also help to bridge the gap. Um, Senegal, I'll leave it there. I write up on time, um, but thank you so much for having us. Thank you all to the panelists as well for joining, sharing your stories and your work. I really appreciate it. Um, and I will just pass it back off. What an incredible conversation. We've been so lucky to have Maya, Brianna, Andrew, and Kenvin for this event. I'm so lucky to hear their perspectives and I'm so lucky to be able to call them friends. So thank you all immensely for just sharing your words of wisdom, your expertise, and your advice with our amazing, our amazing audience at the Hunt Institute. Uh, we have a webinar coming up on October 29th with the former Governor Rick Snyder of Michigan, 2011-2019, the Honorable Governor uh, Paris Glendening, Janelle George, Senior Policy Advisor for the Learning Policy Institute, and moderating that conversation will be Dr. Rick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies at the 
American Crime Institute. The link for that conversation is below in the chat, but I just want to give another amazing thank you to our panelists who have really brought down the heat. I forgot there was a presidential debate because I've been looking forward to this conversation all week and so could not be more grateful for you bringing the heat, bringing your energy, bringing your enthusiasm and actionable solutions. If this is the only conversation you listen to tonight from uh, leaders uh, that will probably have actionable solutions. So very grateful to all of you uh, for your energy and your enthusiasm again. And uh, thank you to the Hunt Institute team who have stayed late to make this happen. So again, please register for the Governing Principles webinar coming up soon and looking forward to seeing you on Hunt Institute webinar soon. Thank you and have a great evening.